Shall we start? Safety cut. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session. We know that people are going to continue uh, coming in over the next few minutes because we're running a little bit late, but we do want to start uh, to give all the presenters their allotted time. So this afternoon session is strategies to enhance hepatitis C screening, and we've got a fantastic international lineup of speakers. And we're going to um, invite our first speaker up to the stage. Um, you forgot to introduce yourself. I've... You should have done that. Thank you, co-chair. We're, we're, we're tag teaming here. So my name is Melissa Dickey. I'm the director of Hepatitis C Knowledge Exchange from Katie. We're a national knowledge exchange organization. It's wonderful to be here. Um, my name's Andrew Radley. I'm a consultant in public health at Tayside, um, and I work alongside Don, John Dillon um, to eliminate Hep C. Um, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Anna of House, um, who's an infectious diseases um, physician, we're told. Over to you, Anne. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for all of you for coming. Um, for first, a small disclosure. Uh, it was actually Jonas who should have presented this study. Um, he is the peer leader of um, this intervention, but unfortunately he's now on paternity leave, so he had to stay with his baby, so I had to go instead, but all credit goes to him and all questions goes to him. And this is how the study is funded. And just a bit of background about Denmark and hepatitis C. Uh, we think we're doing quite well on OST and NSP. Um, and we're also very ready to refer for test and treatment. Um, but on-site testing at treatment centers or needle exchanges um, is not widely available. And in Denmark, we could start treating everyone um, in 2019 or end of 2018 without um, fibrosis restrictions. Um, so this also means that that was when this study started. Um, a little bit about the Danish epidemic, like many other high-income countries, um, we are very aware that it is in the people who inject drugs we have to do our elimination efforts, um, and almost all transmission of HIV is among people who inject drugs. And, but who's actually tested? Uh, we looked at it some years back, in two, up to 2015, what was the determinant of being tested if you um, had hepatitis C and had been, uh, uh, what do you could say, um, attached to a drug treatment center at any stage of your career. Um, and we found out that OST was uh, one of the main determinants, um, but of course injecting was the determinant of actually um, having uh, a risk of having HCV RNA positive tests. Um, and what about all these people we've tested over the years, because we have actually done a good job about testing, we think. 80% um, of them, when free treatment became available, if they, had ever been, if they were on OST, they would still be in treatment. But we had a challenge about those who are not on OST because they usually don't stay in treatment services for very long, and we actually don't know um, how to find them. Um, and in Denmark, we actually don't know how many people inject drugs. Um, that's a bit embarrassing, but that's a fact. Um, and this is why this model of care uh, was very excited 
um, exciting for us to set up in 2018-19 um, because there was the first peer-driven intervention about reaching people uh, on the street to provide test and linkage to care. Um, and it is totally uh, the, the uh, Users Academy, as they're called. Buenos Academy is a peer-driven organization. They employ healthcare workers, healthcare students, um, but it is the peers themselves that drive it and uh, decide what's happening. And they chose that this um, test and treatment intervention that should be at the open drug scene in Copenhagen, uh, right next to a safe injecting room, um, and also very close to one of the big shelters in Copenhagen. And the testing model is quite simple. It's an antibody um, test from Intec. Uh, and then uh, we had a gene expert machine, uh, a finger stick um, model from Cephide. Uh, and then we had, unfortunately, as there's prescriber restrictions in Denmark, we could not treat at the van. Um, but we did a fast track clinic at the nearby hospital. So referral were basically just you put pick up the phone and say, we're coming tomorrow, and then they were ready with a fast track for that person if they wanted treatment as soon as they were, they were diagnosed. And I think that's been absolutely critical for actually getting people through to treatment. And that was actually one of the places where they quickly came up with good solutions, like they had a small stack of phones and phone cards that came with the positive test and say, here's your positive test, here's your phone so we can uh, call you and be sure that you're ready for your pickup for the appointment. And this is how it went um, from May 2019 until October 2022. We've screened about 1,000 persons, some more than once, and found 114 RNA positive. And 80 of these have initiated treatment. And Jonas just called me and said, now 60 uh, 76 persons have completed treatment instead of 75, so it's still ongoing. Um, and those that were not able to go through to treatment um, was unfortunately about some of them was not having um, a Danish social security number, which um, meant we couldn't treat them. And then there were some who came a little later for uh, uh, their test at the hospital and had cleared, some died, and some didn't want it to be treated or allow us to follow up. Um, and I would say that uh, all this in the red box uh, is really due to the effort the peers made. Sometimes it took a year to get into treatment, but they never gave up on people, uh, in the contrary to many hospitals. Um, so they kept them on their list and just waited until they surfaced somewhere and, and reassumed their contact and got a new hospital appointment if they have not uh, been able to persuade them to go to the first one. Um, let's see. And did we actually reach some of these people that we thought we would reach, like people who are not connected to drug treatment services, people who did not inject um, just op opioids? Um, and this is just... Uh, a very brief uh, overview of um, those that were actually HIV RNA positive and majority male. Uh, we have a quite old epidemic in Denmark, so median age of 46.5 years, which is not because we reached the wrong people, but that's just the way it, it is in Denmark. Um, most of them are homeless or unstable housing, uh, and most of them very recent uh, injectors and 50% of them with some sort of mental illness. And this is a bit more busy, um, but it just illustrates uh, that we did engage with people of many different nationalities and origins, um, and that the majority of people were actually above um, 40. And did these people uh, that participated in the study differ from those who are RNA positive. The analysis are not shown here, but uh, as you can see from these data, that uh, 
those old positives were more likely to be frequent injectors and um, more likely to have been connected or actually already connected to a drop treatment center. And the bottom circle illustrates that actually 76% of those who were um, HIV RNA positive were actually currently connected to a drop treatment service but had chosen not to engage with the testing and treatment referral programs there. And I think that's a very important uh, point for this study and what this study uh, shows is that the peer-driven model can engage people uh, that the OST centers just can't. And what was the peer involvement? Um, well, basically everything. Um, they would organize the service. Um, they would go around talking to people, engaging them to visit the van. Uh, they would provide uh, extensive uh, patient support um, for uh, driving them, calling them, uh, being their next of kin if they did not have uh, another support person. They would keep the drugs for them. They would be delivered by the hospital for free. So the patients or their support persons would get the whole treatment with them home at the first visit. Uh, but the peers then could store the medicine for them if they want it, if they didn't want to carry it around. So they were also sort of a small pharmacy um, that could uh, help uh, uh, the people in treatment not um, being robbed or losing the drugs. Um, they also did, uh, continuously have a great involvement in educating volunteers and educating people who are at the, drug, the safe injecting room at the nearby shelter by sort of uh, continuously keeping this awareness of the opportunities for trust and treatment that's available in the van um, to uh, those who need it. And then they have also done a lot of advocacy, um, including that they have like a service where they send out safe injecting equipment to people who might not be um, comfortable of going to get it at an NSP or um, at a drug treatment center. And they have like little boxes they mail to people and with notes and say, do you want treatment for hepatitis C? Just call us. And then they would actually call um, other areas of the country, like my hospital, and say, well, we found this guy who's sitting here. Uh, can you take him in and treat them? Um, and have definitely been absolutely pivotal in changing many uh, prescribers' attitude towards prescribing to people that they don't have actually in their clinic. Um, and was this uh, peer support useful? Yes, 74% of all those who uh, got into treatment uh, received uh, peer support. So um, we think that this model can reach um, the most marginalized patient group. So we can reach people that even though they are affiliated to sort of more standard um, treatment centers, don't use them. And we think we have a, a bit of a threat uh, and a problem that we are trying to address at a national level about not being able to provide treatment for uh, undocumented migrants or migrants who do, do not have uh, a legal residence in the country. And what we really want to do is uh, simplifying the model further, uh, of course, preferably be able to initiate treatment at the first positive RNA test um, so they don't need that extra visit out to the hospital. We just got allowed in Denmark to do pandemic um, treatment from May this year. So that's one obstacle that's been removed, but um, we hope to do that in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, are there any questions for our speaker? Um, I, I'd like to say, um, it seems plain to me, I've heard it several times during the conference, that the cohort who most need care are an aging population, they're homeless, they have mental health issues, and, and that the way to reach them is by local care provision. Um, do you think that's right? Sorry, can you repeat the last part again? Um, providing care where the people already are, rather than making them travel to a hospital. 
Well, I think it, it's, um, well, at least 75% of the population here would probably not have gone to the hospital without this opportunity. So I think it's having these kind of services, and I know they come in many forms, but I think it, they're absolutely critical if we want to reduce uh, prevalence in people who inject drugs because it's just not feasible in any other way. Denmark's a highly digitalized service. Do you not, if you don't uh, use your digital health services, you're if you don't have a stable phone or an email, you have very limited um, possibilities of actually accessing um, health services. So, so these kind of, uh, even in a, a very high income country, um, are essential for elimination. It's a really great presentation. Thank you very much for that. Great. So we'd like to welcome our next speaker up. Sanjel Shilton. Great, so welcome Sanjel. With over 15 years experience leading programs and implementation science, Sanjel leads FINE's hepatitis program. Sanjel started her career in public health as director of operations of a community-based health outreach organization in rural Ghana, and this cemented her dedication to collaboratively designed public health approaches with rigorous data. Thank you. thank you. And thank you everybody for your time today. So I'll be presenting on two randomized controlled trials to measure the impact of hepatitis C self-testing in key populations in Georgia and Malaysia. And I am presenting on behalf of our entire uh, study team. So some important notes before we get into the details of the study. When we are talking about hepatitis C self-testing in this context, we are talking about antibody testing. And it's not here to replace other testing modalities from which the majority of the population learn their status. And it's not a definitive test. So very much like HIV self-testing, which is kind of like a step zero in the algorithm, hepatitis C self-testing would need to be confirmed using the national algorithm. And right now, the hepatitis C self-test that we'll be speaking about are research use only. They are not yet available on the market, but uh, the manufacturers are going through the process for stringent regulatory authority approval, and we do hope that will be available soon. So in July 2021, uh, WHO issued their first ever recommendation on hepatitis C self-testing, that it should be offered as an additional approach to HCV testing, and this was a strong recommendation on moderate quality of evidence, and the link to the recommendation is here, as well as the link to a um, community perspective on the value that hepatitis C testing could bring. So to speak of the two studies, in the country of Georgia, we are working with the National Center for Disease Control, two harm reduction sites, and two sites that provide LGBTQ plus services. In Malaysia, we are working with the Ministry of Health, Malaysia AIDS Council, and DNDI. Our primary objective was to assess the impact on uh, hepatitis C self-testing self on the uptake of antibody testing. So we looked at this through the number and estimate of the proportion of participants who report completing the HCV antibody test, and we were hoping to see that the self-test would increase uptake of testing compared to the standard of care by 20%. We've linked here to the two protocol papers that are published, as well as the clinicaltrials.gov um, study registration. So the overall um, structure of the two studies is very similar. Um, we were integrating hepatitis C self-testing onto an existing online platform that already existed to provide HIV self-testing in these countries. So interested candidates could go to an online platform and complete a short online questionnaire for eligibility. If the person was not eligible, they were referred to an information page on where they could get hepatitis C self-testing and further information. And to note, both Georgia and Malaysia offer free testing and treatment. Um, if the participant was eligible, they were directed to complete the online consent, then they were randomized to either intervention, which was receiving the self-test, or control, which was receiving information for the nearest facility-based testing. And then they completed a baseline survey on demographics, knowledge, attitudes, and practices. The reason why we did this is some of our secondary outcomes were wanting to understand if there was any um, changes in risk behavior. This is because when HIV self-testing first came along, there was some concerns that uh, HIV self-testing may encourage increased risk behavior. Didn't turn out the case. Um, and we also want to investigate this here in the hepatitis C. So then either the participant receives the self-test 
or receives information on where to go for the facility-based testing. One to four weeks after uh, enrollment, they complete online survey number one. Now they can say that they completed the tests and the self-reported results, or that they did not complete the tests, and why not? No matter what, um, after the completion of survey, they got about three US dollars as compensation. And then we repeated this um, six to eight weeks after enrollment with basically the same series of questions. If the participant had reported a, a positive self-test or facility-based test, we asked if they completed further care, cascade, et cetera, and another knowledge attitudes practice. And they again got three bucks. So for Georgia, um, it's a five-armed study, so it's a little bit more complicated than Malaysia. I mean, 1,355 completed the screening questionnaire. These are the reasons for ineligibility. You were not eligible if you already had an RNA test or if you had a previous antibody positive test or if you had already tested in the last six months. Uh, 1,034 were eligible, 12 did not consent, uh, 122 consented, 15 did not complete baseline. Uh, now, in this model, among men who have sex with men, they could be randomized to the courier delivery, to the peer delivery, or to the standard of care, where they were referred to the nearest community-based uh, facility. And for people who inject drugs, they could be randomized to the peer delivery model or the standard of care, where they were referred to the nearest harm reduction site, which offers RDT testing. In Malaysia, a little bit more simple, um, we, 915 uh, users completed the screening questionnaire, the reasons for ineligibility, 791 were eligible and invited to participate, 41 did not consent, 750 enrolled. So if you were randomized to the self-testing uh, arm here, the first 250 randomized received the blood-based self-test, the second 250, well, 249, received the oral, and the last were uh, given information about where they could go at the primary healthcare clinic for um, antibody testing. So just some demographics here. Uh, the participants in Georgia, the median age was 28 across both. Now to note, among the people that injected drugs, the median age was a bit higher at 32 and 34 in the intervention and control respectively. And then also interesting to note, in Malaysia, well, this online platform was intended to serve all key populations. Uh, it clearly is skewed to um, serving um, people who identify as men who have sex with men. There was a much smaller than expected number of people who injected drugs uh, that enrolled. Um, so it's a relatively highly educated population. The majority of participants across all the arms had completed either university or secondary ed uh, education. Mm -hmm. Employment was relatively high, except among the people who inject drugs in Georgia and both the intervention and control, where we see less than 50% reporting being employed. Now this is interesting because the ever testing for hepatitis C before. I don't know if you um, were able to catch the excellent presentation by Dr. Ketavan Srila earlier this morning where she talked about Georgia's elimination progress and they've embarked on an elimination program since 2015 that has really targeted key populations, particularly people who inject drugs. So it was quite surprising to all of us. Also, Ketavan is the PI on this study um, for Georgia that 38% of participants from Georgia reported never testing before. In Malaysia, they've embarked on their elimination a little bit later than Georgia, so they're not as quite mature. And uh, here we see 58% have never tested for hepatitis C before. In this box here, this is the number of participants that have completed at least one follow-up survey. So it is important to note that even though the incentives were the same across all arms, the standard of care um, recipients did not complete the follow-up survey nearly as much as the self-testing. And here we see the completion, the reporting rates of completion of testing. In the blood-based group, 98.1% reported completing testing. In the oral fluid group, 98.7. And in the facility-based uh, facility testing, 51.4%. Now, in Georgia, we see the um, boxes here, which are, again, the participants who completed at least one follow-up sur survey. In Georgia, for among the men who have sex with men, different levels. The courier delivery and the standard of care have lower rates of completing the survey than the peer delivery. And among the people who inject drugs, um, really high results, um, which I think also goes to speak to the dedication of the harm reduction services there and the close uh, interactions and relationships that they have with the people they serve. 
So here we see the completing testing rates across the different uh, groups. And so I'll highlight the people who inject drugs. 95% uh, reported completing a test in the intervention arm, and 76 reported completing a test in the control. So it's 19. Just our 20% increase in uptake is not, not quite there. But to say that the Georgia results are preliminary, as we are still getting in some final data. In terms of linkage to care, the first two columns are what I already showed, but I wanted to highlight the antibody positive results reported. So as um, Dr. Ketavan had said earlier, when Georgia started their elimination program, they were seeing a 51% uh, prevalence among people who inject drugs. We've had the pleasure to work with Georgia and the harm reduction sites through a couple of different projects, and we've seen that prevalence decreasing, but we were quite surprised to see the, the the quite low prevalence that we were seeing um, here. And in Malaysia, the reason to try and go with this model is because of a previous work that we had done with the Malaysian Ministry of Health. They had identified that men who have sex with men may have a higher prevalence. It was coming in around 5%. So they thought that that might be a group that needs to be reached, but very lo lower than we thought. Also, I'd like to highlight that the um, people who report an antibody positive result we consider linkage to care the RNA test, and uh, of the um, intervention arm, they actually went for an RNA test a little bit more than the control, but it's very small numbers. So a few important points to highlight. The results of the test. So I'd like to point out here, sorry, I have to cough. <coughs> it's my first in present, like in-person presentation since COVID, so I'm getting back into the swing of things. Um, it's important to highlight that 11 participants in the people who inject drugs arm reported that they could not read the test, and 22 reported that the test didn't work. So we need to keep this in mind. Additionally, 12 participants reported that they could not understand the results of the test in the uh, intervention arm among people who inject drugs, compared to five in the standard of care. And the majority of participants, 80% across the board, with the exception of the people who inject drugs in the standard of care arm, said that they would like to use self-test again if they had the kit and instructions on how to do it. And so some conclusions. Is the evidence suggests that hepatitis C self-testing increases the uptake of antibody testing. Additional supportive materials may be needed to ensure that people who inject drugs who use a self-test can interpret the results in confidence. And uh, there's a lot of considerations on costs, and we'll be working with Dr. Josephine Walker at the University of Bristol to do a cost-effectiveness analysis. So I'd like to say thank you very much, and I'm keen to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Jason has a question. Uh, Jason Gabby from Kirby Institute. Thank you so much, Sonia. Oh, that's awesome. And great to see the data. Um, I'm just curious, it was encouraging that the testing uptake among people who receive saliva versus finger stick, I'm, I'm pretty sure you presented that it was similar. I was just wondering, have you guys looked at the data? I'm sure you collected data on the acceptability. And have you looked at the acceptability data yet on the people who had saliva versus finger stick? And was it similar? Yes, that's an excellent question. I mean, and so I think that this comes up also in uh, with HIV self-testing. There's a lot of concerns that people may not be keen on doing a blood-based self, blood self-test at home. All, oh, however, this like varies regionally, right? In some sub-Saharan African contexts, they actually prefer a blood-based test as, as well as um, among men who have sex with men in China because they feel the blood-based test is more accurate. So. Here we see uh, very high completions of testing, reported completion about the blood and oral. And before we did this study, we also did some feasibility and acceptability studies in Malaysia um, among these population groups. And there was, before they did the test, there, they, there was a preference for oral, but then they actually did both self-tests in the controlled setting. And afterwards, they said actually both were fine. I don't think there's any more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, next up we have Anna Conway, please. Um, Anna's one of our friends from the, from the Kirby Institute. Um, she's a PhD student, um, and she's gonna tell us about um, implementation of dry blood spot testing for HIV and hepatitis C. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. So today I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague Nigel Carrington and I'm going to talk about the New South Wales DBS pilot study and an evaluation. 
I am from UNSW Sydney and I live and work on unceded Gadigal lands. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So the study wouldn't be possible without a number of important partnerships um, with these organisations, not least um, the funder New South Wales Health and um, New South Wales Health. And I'd also like to thank the many participating sites and all the people that took part in the pilot. So DBS, as we kind of touched on a little bit in the um, lunchtime chat. Um, talk, if anyone caught it, the DB DBS is designed for non-clinical settings, making it ideal for sampling at home and in locations with no clinical spaces. The equipment's minimal, minimal, portable and safe, and the sampling process is relatively simple, so non-clinical staff, including those working in NSPs and peers, can confidently use um, DBS, as well as the clinical staff who aren't accredited for venipuncture. Um, so yeah, it's about the staff being able to offer the test to people when they have the opportunity. DBS is a good opportunity or is a good um, option for people where venous testing can be painful or traumatic as well. And the tests performed in the New South Wales DBS pilot are for HIV and or hepatitis C RNA. Once the lab receives the card, the results take approximately seven days to generate. So the eligibility criteria for the pilot was um, New South Wales residents over 16 years old. Um, HIV eligibility was um, people identify as gay or other men who have sex with men. Also people born in Asia or Africa with sexual partners from Asia or Africa. And also anyone who was eligible for a hepatitis C test was also eligible for HIV. The hepatitis C test eligibility was people that identified as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people that ever injected a drug, people that had ever been incarcerated, or people that had experienced homelessness. So there's two pathways to participate in the study, online self-registration, where the participants register online, a sample kit is sent to them, and after taking their own sample, they can post it back to the lab. Assisted sampling happens through the registered sites, such as the NSP or the Drug Health Service, or in prisons where a staff member assists the person, usually um, the person is engaged with the service, and they're assisted to register um, and take a finger prick blood sample. The site then sends the sample back to the lab. And I should note that uh, at the prison sites in particular, it was run by Justice Health as a blitz model. So testing large numbers of people, usually in the yard, um, out of over a few days at one prison site. And for the at-home arm, the negative results are sent by automated text message, while the positive results are provided over the phone. The nurse helps link people to confirmatory testing and treatment. In the assisted sampling arm, the sites can elect to provide results to the client population themselves. And what I'm presenting today is an ev a mid-term evaluation of the pilot. So the evaluation uses the re-aim framework, which is useful to frame the translation of the um, research into practice. So there's two broad domains. Um, the reach and effectiveness are grouped under individual, um, organized, or sorry, individual factors, and then we have adoption, implementation, and maintenance, which work more towards the multi-level organizational factors. And the impact of um, the um, intervention depends on all of these elements individually and in combination. Although the pilot is still ongoing, the analysis refers to the first few years, so just up until the end of December 2020. And this analysis also presents only the most recent testing episode. So firstly, looking at REACH, this slide summarizes testing in the pilot for both HIV and Hep C. The majority of people participating in the study tested for both, um, both of the diseases, so you can see um, hepatitis C testing was only introduced at the beginning of uh, 2018, towards the end of 2017. And then um, it increased every year except for the first quarter that was impacted by COVID, so the second quarter of 2020. <clears throat> there was around 7,000 people tested for HIV in the pilot, and around half of those, 51%, hadn't had a test in the two years prior to enrolment. That uh, proportion was higher in the online self-registration pathways and the assisted registration in the community.
And then looking at the same for hepat people tested for hep C, there was 4,000 people included in this analysis, and 45% had no tests in the two years prior. That was higher in online self-registration, although uptake was quite low in online self-registration for hep C. And it was around the same proportion for assisted registration and prison. That sat around 45% too. So this table shows who was tested in the pilot. There was two, the two arms of the pilot recruited very different populations. Online self-registration uh, had uh, promotional methods that were mostly targeting many of sex with men. Uh, people at high risk of HIV and um, a high proportion of people born outside of Australia. Half of the people participating at the sites, on the other hand, um, were people who inject drugs, who had recently injected drugs. And within assisted registration, the bulk of the testing, 57%, were, te tests, um, were participants who were incarcerated. And then looking at the effectiveness, so who actually got a new HIV diagnosis? Out of everybody tested for HIV, 0.1% or nine people had a new diagnosis, and eight of those people had participated via online self-registration, so via the postal pathway. And one person was diagnosed when incarcerated. All but one of those people initiated HIV treatment, that one person returned to their home country before initiating treatment. And um, out of those nine people, there was one person who had recently injected drugs. Overall, the proportion of people with current hep C infection in the pilot was 14.7%. Current hep C infection was lowest in the online self-registration pathway, and it was higher in the group of people identifying as non-binary, but it was a relatively small group of 50 people, of which um, 12 were identifying as non-binary. Prevalence was also higher in Aboriginal people and people who had recently injected drugs. From the 878 people that were diagnosed with Hep C in the pilot until 2020, 45% initiated treatment um, within six months. When stratified by pathway, the proportion of treatment initiation varied widely, and treatment initiation was lowest in the people who registered online and self-sampled at home, but as you can see, there was a few people that were diagnosed in this um, pathway, 15. Uh, treatment uptake was highest among people diagnosed in prison. In the community, the treatment uptake was 26%. And it should be noted that this is based on the uh, reporting from the sites that participated in the study. So if somebody uh, went on to initiate treatment at a different site, it's not based on linked data. So um, the clinics may not be aware of that. We also looked at implementation and asked what proportion of the return DBS cards had sufficient sample. Sufficient sample was defined as at, at least uh, three full spots on the DBS card. So over the course of the study, 90% of, um, of the cards had the three full spots, and it was higher in the assisted registration pathway than the online self-registration. So towards the beginning of the pilot, when there was only the online registration option, you can see that the proportion of um, adequate samples was quite low. So identifying this, uh, the team introduced a visual aid to assist people testing at home. And with that, then we saw an increase in the, the proportion of um, complete samples submitted. So in conclusion, the pilot reached uh, people who hadn't recently tested for hep C or HIV. Although there was a low uptake of um, hep C testing via the online self-registration pathway, there's um, the studies now looking at um, involving drug use organizations to promote um, this among people who inject drugs. The high number of tests in prison settings, and there was comparably high um, treatment uptake in the prison setting compared to community and online self-registration. Treatment uptake for hep C testing in the community is lower than in prison, but comparable with standard of care. So the implications, as I said, um, the hep C testing in prisons was um, involved blitzes, so testing large numbers of people um, across a few days. And th that kind of model could increase diagnosis and treatment uptake. 
Uh, the, uh, the promotional strategies needed to improve participation of people in direct drugs um, could increase uptake and diagnosis and online self-registration, but there's still issues around um, treatment initiation in this pathway. And further investigation is needed to understand issues with treatment uptake at home and in the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have you got have we got any questions for our speaker? Um, well, I've got one. So, um, Anna, um, one of the great themes of INSU is about empowering communities and, and demedicalising care, and yours is a great example. Um, have you got any strategies you thought about about increasing linkage to care of people that register online? Um, yeah. So, at the minute, there's um, work uh, done. Sorry, the linkage to care for people who are registered online is um, managed by the Sexual Health Info Link at Sydney. So I think um, really being able to um, support them and um, make sure that they're able to indicate where there's um, a collaborative provider nearby where someone who they're able to get quite low threshold access, so maybe having more, um, uh, yeah, better links across the entire state so that if someone is diagnosed that lives in a rural area, they can be directed to a service knowing that they'll um, uh, be on a simplified pathway to get uh, treatment that because they've been involved in the pilot. I think that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Congratulations. I'd like to welcome our next speaker up to the stage, Zoe Greenwald. So Zoe Greenwald is a PhD student in epidemiology at the University of Toronto, and she's a research coordinator at the Centre on Drug Policy Evaluation. And Zoe's going to be presenting on an HCV RNA point-of-care testing study to measure HCV prevalence and incidence among service users of an integrated supervised consumption service in Toronto, Canada. Hi, uh, thanks so much, and just an advance warning, this is a three minute presentation, so the pace is gonna be quick, but if you have any questions, I'll be pleased to follow up afterwards. So I'm pleased to present this project on behalf of my co-authors. Um, a bit of background to begin with. So there's novel opportunities that are increasing access to hep C testing and care for people who inject drugs. Importantly, point of care HCV RNA testing is a major development. It's important to have HCV RNA tests due to the high expected prevalence of chronic hep C among people who inject drugs. And the introduction of point of care testing has really revolutionized the accessibility of care and decreased uh, issues with linkage to care. Um, having decentralized care, uh, and particularly offering care at integrated supervised consumption services, is important for reaching people who inject drugs who might not be on OAT or might not be connected to other harm reduction services. So with these two developments in mind, they've really revolutionized linkage to care and the possibility for HCV treatment and cure among clients of supervised consumption services, uh, also known as drug consumption rooms. So the objectives of this study were therefore to evaluate the feasibility of offering point of care HCV RNA testing and subsequent linkage to care at an integrated supervised consumption service, and as well to evaluate hep C prevalence and incidence among service users. So this study was set in Toronto uh, between 2018 and 2021. Earlier results from this study were presented at past INSU conferences that looked at the baseline effects. So uh, in this presentation, we're specifically looking at the follow-up and incidence results. Participants in the study were uh, service users of the supervised consumption sites, all had con current injection drug use, were 18 years or older, and could not be currently on hep C treatment. Uh, we had a nurse conduct point of care HCV RNA testing right within the supervised consumption site. And individuals were uh, linked to co-located co care if they were HCV RNA positive at baseline. And if they were HCV RNA negative at baseline, they were offered repeat testing every three months for up to four visits. Um, of note, uh, the Cepheid expert uh, HCV viral load test, which was used in the study, is for research use only in Canada at this point in time and is not yet authorized. Um, and this also means in Ontario, due to the dispensation guidelines and reimbursement guidelines for HCV treatments, uh, same day starts weren't possible because it is required to have a proof of HCV chronicity before initiating treatment. Um, in our analysis, we did disruptive statistics and also for the HCV incidents, uh, included individuals who are HCV RNA at baseline and had at least one follow-up visit. 
Uh, people with lived experience were involved at multiple stages of this project, um, contributing to study design via the patient advisory board, and also employed as program staff and as an indigenous health promoter at the supervised consumption site and within the co-located HCV program. Um, and I'll just mention uh, what's unique about this service is the supervised consumption site is co-located at the South Riverdale Health Center, um, which has a comprehensive HCV care program that's been running for over 15 years. So in terms of our results, 124 uh, SES clients participated. Um, individuals had a high rate of injection, uh, daily injection drug use of 68%, and 73% were experiencing unstable housing at baseline. Uh, at baseline, the prevalence that was observed for HCV was 44%. And over the follow-up period, we observed an HCV incidence rate of 34 per 100 person years. Uh, and this was among the 37 individuals who returned for follow-up testing, 10 individuals seroconverted, and our HCV incidence up to 15 months was 39%. Looking at the cumulative HCV care cascade, including both infections at baseline and over follow-up, 52% were HCV RNA positive, and of those HCV RNA positive, 67% were linked to care, 67% uh, treat, treated, and 86% attained SVR. Of note, the linkage to care was much higher among the people in the incident arm who uh, tested positive over follow-up, which indicates the value of offering repeat testing so individuals can really track the moment that they have seroconverted and get care pulled in at that point in time. So the significance of this is that uh, it was feasible to offer HCV RNA testing within the supervised consumption site, and the high HCV prevalence and incidence that was observed among service users really highlights the importance of having ongoing HCV care offered among harm reduction services. So these are our acknowledgments. Thanks to all the co-authors, the study team, our partners. Um, disclo I'll disclose that this was supported by a microelimination grant from Gilead, and there is in-kind support from Cepheid. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send me an email. Thank you very much, Zoe, for this important study. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but you'll be here to answer any. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Falad Nuala from John Hopkins. Welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this work on behalf of my collaborators. This work is supported by AVDI. In the US, people who use drugs are disproportionately impacted by hepatitis C, but have the lowest hepatitis C treatment rates. And this is because there's a disconnect between where people who use drugs access care and where hepatitis C treatment is routinely offered. In the US, to get treatment for substance use disorders with methadone, you have to go to a site called an opioid treatment program. These are very highly regulated sites where you can receive your treatment, and medical records at these sites cannot be accessed through the routine healthcare system, so that OTPs are separate from the routine medical healthcare system in the US. The good news is that people who use drugs go to the sites multiple times a week and could potentially also access hepatitis C treatment at these sites. Models for routine integration of hepatitis C care into OTPs are needed. The rapid hepatitis C study is a hybrid type 1 effectiveness implementation randomized control trial evaluating hepatitis C treatment with glucopavir, pibrentisvir at OTPs with peer support versus standard of care referral for off-site hepatitis C treatment. We did a pre-implementation evaluation of acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility of hepatitis C integration into OTP sites. This was done through a survey of clinical leadership at five OTPs across Baltimore, Maryland, Birmingham, Alabama, San Francisco, California, and Toronto, Canada. It was conducted August 2021 to May 2022, and we used the AIM, I AM, and FIT um, item surveys, which are strongly considered as markers of post-implementation success. This slide shows the context across the five OTPs we're working with, which is representative of OTPs across um, the US in particular. Majority are in urban areas, and we have one in suburban areas. Across sites, all sites provide both methadone and buprenorphine maintenance, individual and group counseling. Depending on sites, there are additional services, including intensive outpatient treatment, healthcare coordination, or provision of mental health. We see a large number of patients being seen, ranging from 290 to 800. Hepatitis C prevalence is high. And I think it's important to note that in the US sites, you have one provider 
an MD taking care of almost of 300 to 800 patients with two to three RNs in most cases. The only place where you have seven MDs is in Canada, so everything it did is better across the border. Few sites have um, phlebotomy, and funding is either through private funding, fee for service, or bundled payments indicated for treatment of the substance use disorder. Across measures, we see that if we score measures on a scale of one to five, where one is complete, completely disagree and five is completely agree, acceptability of integration of hepatitis C treatment into OTPs was high, with five overall. The appropriateness of integration from the perspective of clients was also uniformly scored high at five. But when you look at feasibility, while providers were comfortable and completely agreed that their role in hepatitis C testing and treatment was warranted, if you look at the last measure, the ease of, of integration was scored much lower at 3.6. And the key reasons are that it's hard to maintain staffing and the momentum of hepatitis C treatment in the face of competing priorities, coordinating new tasks to ensure smooth workflow integration in a system that's set up to only give methadone is hard, and then managing finances of a new on-site treatment in which billing for medical care is separate from the way that substance use disorder treatment is um, billed for is also hard. In conclusion, while integration of hepatitis C treatment into OTPs is powerful and has been shown many times in this, in this um, conference to increase rates of hepatitis C testing and treatment amongst people who use drugs, we do need to pay careful attention to the context in OTP sites in North America to implement these programs in a way that they can be feasibly maintained for the goal of both achieving and sustaining hepatitis C elimination. Thank you. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions? No? I think you're off the hook. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So we'd like to um, welcome our final presenter for this panel, Christiana Merendero, who, be, who is a neuropsychologist working in harm reduction since 2015, currently coordinating a housing first program for people who use drugs and experience chronic homelessness, uh, and a point of care hepatitis C screening and treatment combined with outreach work, a Portuguese NGO, Cresger. Thank you. And thank you all for your resistance. Um, so I'm a psychologist working at Crescer. Crescer is a harm reduction based community association in, in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, I present here the Reachu project, uh, a peer and nursing led outreach team which provides a centralized HCV related care to the most marginalized people in Lisbon. And I really want to begin this presentation by acknowledging and thanking um, all the, the people who use drugs, the people who experience homelessness, and the migrant people who have participated in this project. Uh, this is the declaration of interest. And uh, the RITU project is a completely decentralized intervention which aims to overcome barriers to HCV care in uh, social excluded populations that may not be connected to any other social, health, or even harm reduction service. Based on proximity and relation, um, we develop an on-site, very individualized intervention from testing to treatment, trying also to address people's social needs uh, related to shelter and food during this uh, process. To respect the difficulty that is for vulnerable people um, to interrupt their survival uh, activities to take care of their health, we develop a side project named Bring a Peer, supported by Abvi. Through this, we provide financial incentives to people who participate in the REACHU project and uh, also to informal peers uh, who promote the connection uh, with other beneficiaries uh, of REACHU. As you can see in these images, uh, we meet people really where they, are, where they are, and I mean we take all the materials we need in a backpack and we meet people in open drug use scenes in the middle of woods, as you can see, or um, 
spaces where people spend the night uh, among others. Our sample is composed mostly of males, uh, Portuguese experiencing homelessness, 50% uh, reported sharing injecting equipment at some moment uh, in their past, and 60% were, uh, were not engaged with any other health service. So here we compare um, our previous standard of care on your left, where RNA tests and appointments were taken in the hospital with uh, the RICU, the centralized model here on your right. As you can see, the centralization improved uh, the number of people who completed treatment, uh, of course, as we predicted. I also want to highlight that 95% of um, the people who did treatment were firstly integrated into a shelter, into a rented room, or into a housing first program, which is also for us a very important result. To conclude, I will highlight the importance of multiple stakeholders. ReachU is a project with the involvement of an European program, a municipality, a public hospital, a pharmaceutical company, researchers, and the community-based association, where everybody has an important role, and I will take this opportunity to really thank them all. Peer engagement uh, in informal and formal ways is mandatory to promote proximity, familiarity, and safe spaces. Financial incentives are a must needed. Um, take care of health should not put a question, in question the daily income uh, of an already vulnerable person. Uh, our focus is always uh, on the person in, and uh, their quality of life, perceived quality of life. And for this reason, HCV care and social care go hand in hand. Um, and all this just makes sense uh, if we reach people, and for that, decentralization of care is essential. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Well, I've got one. So, um, Christiana, um, yeah. it, it seems to me an emerging theme that um, social care and increasing quality of life with looking at the wider um, determinants of, of a good quality of life are essential um, components of, of HCV care. That's what you've said, I think. Yeah. Um, all the people in our perspective in the field want um, to be treated when they realize they have a problem, a health problem. Uh, but the question is, they have um, social necessities that are so basic, like related with shelter, where I will sleep this night, uh, what I will eat today. They need to prioritize this um, and not their, their treatment. So these projects need to help people to do not need to choose between one or another. Yeah, we've talked about, um, in, in this conference, about regaining citizenship and about being included in society. I think that's a really good example of what we need to achieve. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, that concludes our session. If you're joining us at the conference dinner tonight, a reminder that this starts at 7 p.m. at the platform on Argyle Street in Glasgow City. Remember to bring your name badge or they won't let you in. Um, this is your ticket for the event. Um, I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.